And it's good to be up on a Saturday morning at the Share Universe Studios here in Red Bank, New Jersey. I'm Rob Akinpour, and this is The A-Game. It's usually either Saturday mornings or on Monday nights. You can find my podcast. Go find me on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. And also, click a like on it, The A-Game with Rob Akinpour. It'll be worth it. We're at episode, I think, 84 if you keep keeping score at home. And then I get to reach out to somebody who I actually worked with back in the day. And I walked into this building in 1988. I think Karen officially was like the third person I had met at that point because... I think I was probably getting trained on the board or something. You happened to be there. And yeah. Then, yeah, for about a year and a half, our paths would cross. Matter of fact, I replaced you on the overnights at That's F-163. Right. That's then, right. That's right. Big yeah. shoes to fill, Rob. And yeah, there was very big shoes to fill because you look at it. How many years later? By the way, when Karen was working there, she was 13. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly felt like I was 13. That's oh, sure. we, we all did. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Yeah. But, I mean. It's it's an amazing ride. For 30 plus years, you have been a voice that has been comfort food to everybody in the New York City area, Aww. delivering delivering traffic for everybody. And CJ, if I can get photo number one over this, this is an article that came out earlier this year. And I thought this was great for you to get, you know, and actually having the, the printed media from Newsday, which I thought was really cool. In the sports section, a full page for crying out loud. Yeah. And I mean, I understand why they decided to do the sports thing, but it really wasn't a sports article, which is the highest part of the the compliment to you because it was about you and what you do and not necessarily about what's going on at WFAN. That's right. It was it was uh, pretty mind blowing. I thought there was going to be a lot of boomer in there. Um, I thought there was going to be a lot of uh, a lot of other things other than me. And mm-hmm. he really wanted to do an article about um, about how I really just was trying to relate to these listeners. And, you know, I mean, we're talking WFAN here. We're talking men, you know, yeah. like, you know. Like eighty, I think it's like eighty-two percent male. It's, yeah, it sounds about right. Of course, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, and men just wanted. St- I mean, not just women too, but you know, a lot of men are just like just give, just give it to me straight. Don't right. lie to me. Don't tell me it's going to be okay. Just tell me what I have to deal with. And you know, people just they just appreciate somebody who sympathizes. They really do, as as we all do. Mm-hmm. You know, we all do. To, but to find that balance, because when you first started in traffic, I mean, it's not what it is now. I mean, you really have become this personality. And like you said, and I want to give credit to the article who called you blunt, cynical and bitingly funny. And anybody <laughs> that knows you, that's an accurate description of Karen Stewart. I was going to say, you know, you know, that's pretty much me. Yeah. In a nutshell. Absolutely. In a loving way. And. That comes across. I mean, sometimes you hear you say something. You, Did you really just say it? And I'm like, oh, I get it. It's sort of that. Okay, it's. Karen. I know they actually they actually let me say suck on wins, but very sparingly. Very sparingly. <laughs> but they let me say it if it really does suck. Right. You but know. but that didn't come right away. I wouldn't no. think because yeah, I mean, when you started in 1990, it was more okay. I got to get used to this. I got to just report the stuff. When did you feel that the transition was coming? Okay, I'm starting to be more me here and really let my personality shine while delivering what I have to deliver with news or traffic, whatever the case may be. Well, I mean, I started at Shadow Traffic in Mm -hmm. in 90. Right. And I did that for several years. I did that for 20 years on and off. Right. Um, I was sent to radio stations to work there instead of like uh, GMs were, were saying, we'd like to have her here. Yeah. So okay, sure. it w- right. So it was like I was on these shows, uh, morning shows, which are a good outlet for displaying your personality. Yes. That's true. And then it was just a natural change to when I went back to Shadow and when I, as as far as the building goes, and doing several radio stations and wins included in that, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, the personality just came out, and I never got a bad phone call about it. Like I was always waiting for somebody to go, "What the hell are you doing?" Right, right. You're figuring, okay, where am I getting flagged for like a better? Right. We don't we don't pay you to sympathize, but um it worked. Yeah. You know, and people appreciated it. And uh I just I've gone with it ever since. You realize you have become comfort food in that sense. And around the New York area, when they hear you, they they know what they're getting and you are the comforting factor one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, I try to be and you know, I'm from Brooklyn. And mm-hmm. I, at this point on wins, everybody knows I'm from Brooklyn. I every time I talk about Brooklyn, I always relate that information because they it comforts people to know that i'm with them on this that i yes. know i know what i'm doing mm-hmm. because i'm from brooklyn i i know the city right um and it's just real it's just it's just a matter of trying to be relatable to people and yeah. you know we all try to do it 
and it's easier with traffic because it's a frustrating factor and it's easier to display that that comfort and relief to people in in, in a service work job which mm-hmm. is traffic and i would think it's harder in a sense to be relatable because you know from being a jock i mean now let's go back to htg when you're getting your start at fm 1063 mm-hmm. so you know you're in the building it's 1987 uh, we meet about a year later. Yeah, I know. I can't. 19. I was 10. I was 10. Was 10. Yeah, that's right. You were not 13. You were 10 at that point. <laughs> but your your whole thing is you're trying to develop your style, become a personality, and you're doing it in a – and anybody who's ever worked with us at 106.3 will tell you it is one of the most interesting and bizarre places, but lovingly. Yeah. And, you know, here we are. And, this, and here you are, the Brooklyn girl coming down to the Jersey Shore in Eatontown. Right. And, and your first reaction when you saw the house was like, this is radio? I'm getting- Yeah, I said, this is like a horror movie. This isn't like a radio job. Right. And, you know, because it was somebody's house. Yeah. And, you you, you uh, were not prepared for that, obviously. No, I wasn't. But I was so ready to jump into uh, radio work um, after, you know, the after LIR. Yeah. Um, I was so ready to get into it. And I, I, I'm a music, like, fiend. I'm just right. a music fiend. And especially with alternative music. And that was where my heart was when I started. I wanted to be a jock. Right. Um, you know, I didn't want to do news. I didn't understand that you could actually, you know, um, again, with the personality, display that in a service work job. Right. Exactly. You know, and it is and it was difficult. But, I, you know, I just wanted to be on the air and I just wanted to talk about music. And if it was in somebody's freaking house, that right. was fine. But it's interesting, like you said, you started out doing work at LIR and you go from like one of the historic modern mm-hmm. rock stations in the world yeah. to the other historic. I mean, if we look at the five, and I think you'll agree with this, HTG, LIR, WFNX in Boston, K-Rock in LA would mm-hmm. definitely be four of the, the stations yeah. when it came to early modern music. Yeah, that's cred right there. You know, yeah. I mean, if you're, <clears throat> if you've been a part of any of those stations, that's cred. And yeah. two of them, Where you, you know, yeah. it's really, uh, um, it's, it's great. It's really great to be able to say that. And people respect that. Oh, big time. You big know? Time. Yeah. Because they know HTG is in the house and they know at the time we didn't know we were making history at HTG. No, I, I think that's the, that's, and again, I'm going to get into another tangent with that a little later on. Hmm. But um, when you. A tangent, you. A tangent, Stop it, you know, yeah. You don't know me well. You Stop know me it. well. <laughs> yes. This woman knows me way too well. But it's a story <laughs> altogether. Um, but. When you go from one modern rock station to another modern rock station, you're looking at HCG as like, okay, now this is my opportunity to express myself, be the try to develop me, right. who I am. Right. And then you segue into traffic. It's sort of like, okay, I know I'm getting a more of an opportunity, there's more money in pocket and all this stuff. But that's where I would think there was that, oh, wait a minute. Okay, now am I going to be me? And the fact that it's become what it's become now. Right. I mean, obviously. Like you said, like I said before, didn't happen overnight, but when it did, boom, it really clicked for you. And exactly. And I kind of like weaseled my way into doing traffic, but not for nothing. <laughs> I just I, I went to Shadow. I right. interviewed with Pete Toriello. I know the name, absolutely. And then he told me to go see Dennis O'Mara, who was the GM of Shadow at the time. Mm-hmm. I went to Dennis and I said, Pete said I'm really good and I should talk to you. And he goes, Well, uh, okay, great. And so, you know, talk to Pete some more. And if he says it's a go, it's a go. So I went to Pete and I said, Dennis says it's a go. <laughs> and before you know it, I was hired and they didn't know that story until about, I don't know, 15 years after. after oh, wow. That. But yeah, I sort of weaseled my way. And right. you know, I just knew that I could do it. I, you know, I was always, I was always very much like, you know, uh, there's nothing I can't do. Well, see, I give you credit for that, Karen, because I don't think everybody can do this. I'm the first to admit, I don't know if I could just do the traffic thing and really syllableize and just because it is a pacing thing. It's like, OK, you've got X amount of time to right. get all the information out, maybe generate a little bit of who you are into it right. and then get moving. And then right. you're kind of doing this constantly and for people who don't know. Karen's doing this like six times an hour on on wins. And then you got to go over the FAN and do it over there. So you're doing what? And I also do CBS FM now. And CBS, okay, they so you threw that. They threw that at me in January. Okay, so what is it now? Ten, like ten yeah. reports an hour. Hey, when I was at Shadow, I was doing twenty-one reports an hour. Whoa! Ow! I had no I, idea. I've been on in some form or fashion 
in the tri-state area pretty much everywhere yeah, um as far as you know the traffic reporter and um you know being some places for a really long time like dha yeah some places, some places like mca another classic uh you know uh, another classic music station with some of the biggest names ever you know you got harry harrison and you had oh yeah I mean, everybody was the MCA good guy, you know. Oh yeah, five seventy AM, absolutely. Yeah, and I just, I, I, I didn't mind at the time, you know. I mean, like, you know, we remember we we're in our twenties. I was like twenty. I think I was twenty, almost twenty-one when I got hired to chat. I wasn't even twenty-one. Wow. So you know, it was easier back then, Rob. <laughs> Everything's easier when you're younger. Everything was easier back then, dude. Like you name it, frying an egg, easier back then. It's sad but true. Oh my gosh. <laughs> No. I mean, I have Karen Stewart here. Um, I'm going to go back to a couple photos now um, because we talk about some of the personalities you've worked with. Some of them have been legendary. Um, yeah. I'm going to, because I don't have the number here. CJ, why don't you go toward the bottom and go about four up? Stop. Uh, one more. No, back up, back up, back up right there. Hit that. Jim Kerr. I mean, one of the legends of radio when it comes to the New York area. Now, what do you take out of an experience working with Jim? I still get amazed when I work with Jim. Hmm. Um, I I was a radio fan and a, actually a radio junkie before I was even on the air anywhere. Okay, and so you, you clearly know who the name Jim Kerr is. Yes, yeah. yes. I was nervous as hell when I when I did a traffic report for him once filling in for somebody. And now I've been on with him at three stations. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, when I wasn't working at Wins, he would always pull me in to fill. Like I filled in. I was Shelly Sunstein's filling for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when I was in high school, there was a girl who, uh, tried to beat me up, who had a, we went to Catholic school and we had the vest with the, over the white shirt and the back of the vest said, Jim Kerr rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and then I end up working with Jim Kerr and I'm like getting this like guttural fear. And all I see is this chick from high school, you know, um, but I mean, my heart every, palpitations on top of it. Of oh course. my God. Forget it. The, it was more stressed because I was thinking of this girl than, you know, working with Jim, but <laughs> It was. A, it's an honor always to work with Jim Kerr. He's the best at what he does. Um, talk about natural. Yeah. I mean, that's Jim off the air. That's what you see is what you get with Kerr. Mm-hmm. And um, it's always every time I work with him, or every time he texts me, mm-hmm. or every time he emails me, I'm like, wow, this is so freaking cool. Yeah, I mean, that's high price. Like, yeah. You got to get that feeling of like, going, oh, I've earned the respect of one of the legends. Yeah, of radio. it doesn't get much better than that. You know, yeah. I mean, like I have people who I know who are in radio who got excited when he just friended them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I'd be the first to say that. That's true. I mean, there's been a couple like uh, I'll give an example. When Ian O'Malley became a friend of mine, I went, holy crap. Ian O'Malley. I know Ian. Yeah, he's. He's another one. He's he's his life is pretty amazing. But I mean, yeah, it's just he's a legend. And it, it's like everything else. If you're in advertising, you look up to somebody. Right. If you're a doctor, you look up to somebody. And when you get to work with these people, mm-hmm. um, it makes you talk about like a, an ego booster. Like you're really oh, you feel very you really feel good about yourself because this dude is OK with being on the air with you. And this guy's a legend. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very cool stuff. I've worked with a few legends. It's You have. Um, you mentioned CBS FM. Uh, you've been on there before, though, now that they've added the duties. But if we can go back, uh, CJ, the photo you were at, go down one, please. That one. Yeah, and, Mickey Dolan's. Yeah. Now, that was it. I remember when they hired Mickey, and I'm like going, okay, you've hired a guy who's been an actor, who's been a musician, but he's never really done the radio thing. Did that feel kind of like, okay, I, in a sense, have more experience than Mickey, but Mickey's going to be the glue to the show. And by the way, if you're looking behind Karen, there's Mr. G. Irv Joukowsky, who everybody remembers from uh, CBS Weather on Channel 2 in New York. What a great, another great guy. Irv yeah. is a great guy. Yeah. Really is. And Mickey, I mean, what are you going to say? You can't complain about Mickey Dolans. You can't say, no. oh, he, he's not experienced in radio. He's freaking Mickey Dolans. You know, he's he's like the entertainer. He's an icon. I mean, I when I was sick from school, I watched the monkeys on TV. Yeah, we, we all did, absolutely. You know, and all of a sudden, like, I'm there with him posing for a picture, and I was in the back of the picture, and they're like, "No, come up front." I'm like, "Me? Yeah. Come up front?" <laughs> you know, and um, that was really, really cool. I'm still, uh, I'm still friends with Mickey. Like, I can, I talk to him. Yeah. You know, every once in a while online, and I mean, you know, it's one of those things you just you just check off like, okay, legend number two. Oh yeah, believe me, if I 
I always wanted to interview one of the guys from the monkeys in my career. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately we don't have many left. So no. Mickey, yeah, Mickey would be like, I always felt like Mickey was the one that always brought out the most personality where Nesmith may have, been the, may have been the most intelligent and Davey was the one everybody loved. And Peter was sort of on his own planet, for lack of a better term. Oh, my gosh. You want to hear a really cool story, like oh, two please. seconds? Yeah. Jim Kerr and Mickey Dolans were in a bar. It sounds like a joke, right? Oh, yeah. Well, hold on. I'm already like, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, no. well, with a duck on their head. No. So, duck on- <laughs> <laughs> so they were in a bar. And Jim told me the story. And somebody from the bar, some dude came over to them and said, it is such an honor to meet you guys. And Jim's like, oh, wow, thank you. How does he even know who I am? And the guy thought he was Peter Tork. (laughs) Oh, no. He thought it was Mickey Dolenz and Peter Tork. And Jim's like, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to ask my producer, CJ, go back to the photo with Jim Crow. I want to pull that up again because I'm like looking at this. There's nothing Peter Tork. No, there really isn't. There really isn't. But I guess... uh, (laughs) <laughs> that person was just like assuming, and I guess there was some kind of uh, uh, thing that made him think he was at that time. It was long enough ago where Jim was still a blonde and not okay. really gray. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the guy put two and two together and got eight, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> which usually happens in a bar when you've had two and two and you want, why am I eight drinks in suddenly? Exactly. <laughs> so because Mickey and Jim are very good friends. Oh, I didn't realize that they were that close. Yes, they're very good friends. So um, it was that I thought that was a great story. Yeah. I still call him Peter every once in a while. I'm like, hey, Peter. <laughs> nice inside joke. I like exactly, that. exactly. Why is she calling you Peter? Uh, it's a long <laughs> uh, go to the bottom photo because this is who she spends a, a little bit of time with these days. And as as a Jets fan, I'm like going, oh, Boomer, we love I Boomer. I know. I mean, he's Boomer Sison for crying out loud. You know, the guy. If he's not in the Football Hall of Fame, he will be. Is he in the football hall of fame? That's a good I don't question. think so. I don't, I don't think so either. My husband, I think, was telling me that he didn't think he was either. But um, I believe it'll come. And Boomer is, uh, Boomer's the kind of guy that if you come up to him in a in a Starbucks, he'll he'll talk to you for fifteen minutes. That's great to hear. Really yeah, is. he's not he's not like you know you think that a lot of people you meet you know that you think are really nice you meet them and they're jerks. Yes, Boomer is not that person. And um, he's just great to work with. He always has something nice to say about people. And, um, you know, we get along great. And he's just it's it's fun just adding another person that I'm honored to to work with. Sure. And he's, a, a you know, going to become a broadcast legend in his own right for, the, for for TV. Oh, yeah. Just what he's doing in the NFL and CBS and the pre right. I'm sure. But Absolutely. with radio, too, I mean, the guy's a natural. He just, you know, I mean, he's talking about stuff that he loves, of course. So he's just. <laughs> But he's a, he's a really great guy, and he's huge. In yeah. case you didn't know, he's like six five. Big, I didn't know. Like, yeah, and and, he's and like I, a big boy, six four. He's gotta be. And by the way, Karen is not a short woman. Yeah, no. I, like going. If I remember correctly, she's taller than me. So, I'm, I'm five like, eleven. Yeah, yeah so. I remember. I'm like going. I'm like five nine. I was like, hi, Karen. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And she's tall, and she's gonna beat us up too. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, but it's good to hear that about Boomer because it's just he seems very just genuine in in general. So to know that it's like okay, that carries over. It's just what you're hearing is the real guy. He's yes. found his niche in the sense, kind of doing this, and he just didn't put a facade on. He's like, look, here's who I am, and if it right. works great, if it doesn't, okay, I tried. You know, and it was hard for him too because he was replacing Don Imus. Yeah, and, you know, and. He was a little intimidated as well, very little, I'm sure. Not that mm-hmm. I know this for for certain, but just because he had to, radio was a new thing for him, right? Um, as far as a regular gig, mm-hmm. and you know, Don Imus is Don Imus, yeah. And, and, you, he, and then, by the way, I know we got a photo here. I'm going to pull it up here. Uh, CJ, go up a little bit uh, toward uh, the one under Kevin Bacon. There you go, that one. Not right there. Yeah, because, I mean, they are. I mean, you've appeared on IMS when all the cameras were there uh, when he was doing his show on MSNBC. Right. So, you know, y- you understand the appeal of what Don still had, even in his later years. There was still that v- vivaciousness that the audience had for the guy. Yeah. So for, you know, to Boomer to step into that, even though they're trying to go in a different direction, and obviously it paid off. But at first, I can see where for everybody it's going to be like, okay, we're walking away from a legend, you know? Right. Yeah. 
you know, it's like it's like anything else. It's as if, if you know, if you were to replace Don Imus, you'd be like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I'd be throwing up in a corner every minute. I know, right? And then, of course, you can do it. Of course, you can do it. But, you know, you're just feeling like the shoes are way too big, dude. Yeah. The shoes are way too big, and I can't. Uh, uh, there's no way. And Boomer just fit right in, and people love him because – and he is genuine. So if anybody's wondering – if he's putting on something, he's not like he's actually nicer off the air than he is on the air. That's um, great So right. yeah, so there's some comfort in that if you're a Jets fan and a Boomer fan, <laughs> you got the real deal. Amen. And the funny <laughs> thing, and the funny thing is, here you are. You're probably recognized a little bit more for FA and although recognized considerably for 1010 wins, but you're not really a sports fan. No, I don't <laughs> even know how many innings are in a football game. So <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs> So, no, I'm not a sports person. My husband's a sports person. Uh -huh. You know, I was always pushed my whole life to do sports because I was really tall. They wanted me to be a basketball player. They wanted me to do this. They wanted me to do that. And it, I never got left alone about it. And I was a music person. I was, you yeah. know, I'm a left side of the brainer, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just didn't, and I guess it just put some sort of a taste in my mouth where I just took sports and completely put it aside and said, I don't even want to know. And it's just not my thing, dude. It's right. just not my thing. Right. But, um, you know, and being a traffic reporter on a sports station, it doesn't have to be your thing. No. Um, but, and I think they, and they also get a lot of comic relief from the fact that I'm not a sports person. So, I mean, you know, like, <laughs> sure. I'll go on sometimes other than my traffic report and, you know, talk about sports. And it's, it's kind of funny because I can't talk about sports. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's cool. It's, it's cool. And I've learned a little bit there, but no, not right. sports, not a sports person. I do a segment called Random Shots. I'm going to get into that in a second. I want to ask one more question because you've been around this now where you've seen now where studios – here's the TV cameras. You've seen it with Imish. Now you see it with Boomer, mm -hmm. uh, what he's doing with the CBS Sports Network and everything that's going on. There's no way you could have visualized this like, okay, radio has become a camera medium. What? Yeah. No. I – um, no. That was – it was always, it's always weird when that happens. But I got to tell you, there's some, I don't know. There's something in my brain where I always just believe – that I'm not gonna have a problem doing it. I'm gonna, I can do it no problem. Yeah. And and then I, I kind of, you know, I crap my pants later. But <laughs> <laughs> real, you know. But um, I sort of go into things like no problem, no yeah. problem, no problem. And um, it, you know, it works out. And if you kind of believe in yourself, and yeah. this is with anything, obviously. I mean, this is what we tell our kids, right? Yeah. If you believe in yourself, just no just it's going to be easier to get things done it's going to be easier to do things and just be confident that you can do anything i i mean i mean i think you'd agree like i can learn anything so could you know you could learn anything mm -hmm. so it's um you know i just felt like okay if i have to do that i'll do that you know no problem right <laughs> you know and my brain's going, no problem, problem, problem. Right, yeah. The right, the one side of the brain is like, yes. warning, warning, danger, Will Robinson. The other one's Absolutely. like, you got it, you got it. Don't worry Absolutely. about it. That's yeah. right, that's right. So you know, just kind of uh, hold my breath and jump in there, and uh, it hasn't really failed miserably yet. After 30 years of doing this, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Stop remember? saying that, Rob. Yeah, well, you were 12 when you started. Remember That's that. true. That's true. <laughs> you remembered. I do. Karen Stewart here on the A-Game. Okay, Random Shots is just a segment of questions that can come from anywhere. It's me stalking your social media. It's me knowing you a little bit that I can do some of this and knowing your background. Right. So, all right. I got I to gotta start with some fun shit. All right. Who pulls off the bald head better, Matt Pinfield or Andre Faro? Here comes the HGG versus LIR comparison. <laughs> Andre. Wow. Okay. I'm going to give it to Andre. He's kind of just, he's got that sort of essence about him where the bald head looks really, it just looks sharp on him. Matt is not about looks. Matt is about his legendary knowledge of rock and roll and his personality for sure. and his personality. But you know what? You're right. Matt's been bald since we were, were at HGG. Actually. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. I think Matt started like in, maybe in his early twenties that the, the hair was just kind of like, that's it. You know? Did you know that Matt Pinfield is the subject of the killer song? Um, uh, all these things that yeah, I've done. No, yes. Which I, when I found that out, I was like going, Okay, Matt, you have not reached legendary status. Congrats. That is cool. And that's the name of his book. Matt did a biography. In that yes, name. he did. I was, I was very happy to, that Matt agreed to come on my podcast uh, about a year and a half ago, right? literally right after he came out of rehab. So I, I, uh, he didn't have to do it that quickly. But when he did, it was like it was a very revealing yes. hour or so. I mean, again, 
really happy that he did that. Absolutely. And Matt's, Matt's, Matt's a great guy and another radio legend. He's just a radio legend. Well, which brings me to the next question. LIR just had a film within the last year about everything LIR. Fascinating film. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's yes. really worth it. As you having enough years at HTG, a couple of years, could you see a film being done about HTG and everything that happened at FM 106.3? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, HTG is a legendary, nationally recognized legendary radio station. Yeah. I don't see why not. It's the same deal that LIR was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, HTG was in a little house. LIR was in this little crappy second floor of a building with a diner at the base of it. Yeah. Like, they weren't even high enough status to be the diner on the first floor. They had to be up on the second floor. Second floor, yeah, it's true. Um, and they're in the same they're in the same category for for somewhat different reasons in some areas, but uh, yeah, sure, why not? Of course. And you hit it on the head for somewhat different reasons, and I think that's the reason I respected LIR because they they really did program the Long Island, and they went more new wave techno and made it work. HDG 106.3 went kind of with the trends, but we're always ahead of the trends. So it's like, okay, right. lunch is about the wide open. Oh, we were on that four months before it ever happened. You know exactly. It, and I think that was sort of the charm of HGG, but the charm of LIR as well was, hey, we stuck to our guns and both stations stuck to their guns. Did what they did best. Yeah, absolutely. And LIR brought a, a lot of European music to New York. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, um, you know, they played like Nana, 99 Love Balloons in German yeah. about seven months before <laughs> the song was translated to English and she re-recorded it. I mean, you know, it's just it's stuff like that that um, really puts you ahead of the game. It's risk taking. It's all about risk. Oh, absolutely. I, I think the best example I can give with 1063, even though he wasn't huge in America, he had pockets of success. And get, thank you, Miles Hunt, again for coming on my podcast. Miles from the Wonder Stuff is talking about oh, the, the, the Wonder Stuff's a great band. Oh, absolutely. And they great, it, great band. And I can remember them playing the Stone Pony, and Miles is going through the American tour, the highest drawing show on that club tour. Was the Stone Pony in Asbury Park when the, when the Wonder Stuff came to Jersey? That was sort of that that feeling of okay, what we're doing is making an impact, and it's getting right. people excited. And and you'd never hear the Wonder Stuff if it wasn't for HGJ. Yeah, exactly. And you I know, you would, never you wouldn't have heard it. And who knows why? Because they're fabulous. Oh yeah, they really really are. Um, we were talking about some of the people that you've worked with. You've also have had some celebrity run-ins. Uh, matter of fact, uh, um, above the boomer photo is one. If you pull that up for me, CJ, right there. Oh, there we go. My heart. Yeah. My heart. How, do I blame heart. you? No. I mean, who wouldn't be like in heaven? Like, going, I'm having a kiss moment. Life is good. I was a major. I was like the kiss fan. Um, I was Ace Frehley in Brooklyn Day Camp in the end of the year show. Um, oh, I really, wow. I mean, I was, you know, since I was about uh, 10, 11 mm -hmm. and I've loved them ever since. And do I follow kiss as much as I used to uh, after like 1990? No, right. but I know all the songs that they release and I still, uh, they're like idols of mine. And Jim Kerr invited me to come over and be his guest on this, um, I heart radio thing with kiss. Cause he was doing the interview with them. Okay. So I went and. I mean, I it was it was enough to keep me to try to keep me from crying. Like it was really like it really hit me that I was meeting these idols. So I met Paul. That was backstage after the fact, but in the beginning, mm -hmm. I met Paul first before the interview even happened. And then I met Gene. And then Gene, the first question he asked me was, "Did I sleep with you?" <laughs> that is the first question he asked me. I'm like, I don't think so. I might have remembered that. Yeah, I would think he is too much, man. Gene Simmons is too much. Too much. He's so and it, very nice guy, but he is just like blunt as hell. I mean, he's just, who hasn't he slept with? I don't think he slept with you. He hasn't slept no, with me. He slept with me either. I, I, but I, I think he slept with everybody but us, actually. Yeah, I think he might be right. <laughs> Would that be considered like the starstruck moment, or was there another celebrity that kind of just hit you where it's like, oh my God? Paul no. Stanley was my most, my most heart stopping, yeah. em emotional. Like when we were in that picture and he's got his arms around me. I literally, I could have died right there and been like with a smile on my face. I just, from my heart, I was so happy. Um, and I've met a lot of people, man. I met you a lot. Have, of people. I mean, I can run. I can run down a couple of names. I know you've you've met Charlie Sheen. You've met Kevin Bacon. Yeah, put up a Charlie up there while you got it. There you go. There's you with Charlie Sheen. Winning. Uh, Winning, duh, winning. And, <laughs> uh, when the Bacon Brothers go down in the next one, I mean, when Kevin was uh, touring with his band, so you had that moment. Right. Um, 
two two more down. Now, not everybody knows Rucker Hauer. I'm a huge Rucker Hauer fan. Oh my God, this this is this is definitely. I'm glad you brought this up. Thank That's you. number two, and it's so close to Paul Stanley. It's scary. Rucker Hauer. I, I had a dog named Rudy. I named him after Rucker Hauer. But Rucker oh, Hauer okay. was so beautiful to me. He was like the ideal dude. Nice. Like the ideal guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he died, him and Prince, when they died, I was I was really crushed. Like like as if almost like a family member was was Ow. gone. Yeah. Prince particularly hard. Here's my Prince tattoo. Oh, there you go. Love that. Um, I, you know, Prince was a whole a whole different thing. When he died, I felt like it was it was really like a step back from music. Mm -hmm. All that music that we weren't uh, what another maybe 35, 40 years we could have gotten out of him of music, and now we can't get it. That's true. Amen. It's drugs, man. It's all this drugs. It's Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson. Uh, you know, it's uh, it. It doesn't stop. This no. business you, it just is relentlessly evil in a lot of ways. And sadly, and I and, and this and I can remember vividly being on the air and having to report the Michael Jackson when I was working down at WSTW uh, in the Delaware Valley, and I'm keeping tabs with our news station where all yeah. of a sudden the news anchor comes in and goes can't confirm this but i think michael jackson may be dead and we're like so i'm literally going on the air every five minutes after every like every two songs going unconfirmed reports of saying michael jackson right and, yeah so it was like all of a sudden i became news reporter but the same token once oh come on it's michael jackson every yeah, yeah, yeah I mean. everybody had to at that point but you know from that end where it's like you're trying to keep tabs on everything where it's like okay how many organizations have and that was really the moment where T I hate to say it, TMZ kind of became credible because Absolutely, TMZ yeah. broke it first. They because really they did. always yeah, they I don't know how they do it, but they managed to do it. And poor Farrah Fawcett. Yeah. Who died on the same day as Michael Jackson. And got lost and, in the shuffle, sadly. And got absolutely pushed to the side. Absolutely. Yeah. And Farrah Fawcett, you know, obviously a legend in her own right, but mm -hmm. uh it was like, you know, five years later, people like Farrah Fawcett's dead because Michael Jackson literally took that over, you sure. know. <sighs> and if I could say one more thing about Rucker Howard, if you've never seen The Hitcher and if you've never seen, if I can remember, uh, yeah, uh, I knew it. Sin City. Yeah, Sin City. And one of his last films, which is literally just a low budget kind of hobo with a machine. I mean, that film shocked the shit out of me because I'm like going, I didn't expect it to be A, as entertaining as it was. B, that I was like, I'll watch it again because I thought, oh, God, right. Howard's doing this B movie that's going to suck. And right. it didn't. No, he lo he loves doing stuff like that too. And I, you know, I obviously I met him. He showed the picture and stuff. And yeah. I met him a couple of times. I would go to a lot of different conventions if he was here there just to see him. Oh, well, I didn't realize he was like on that con circuit at one point. Oh, he, well, that picture that picture is from um, is from a convention. What's the big one with the um, San Diego Comic Con in L A. Or he was at Comic Con because Sin City had come out. Okay. Okay. And yeah, Sin City was world. a comic. Sin City yeah. was a comic. And That's true. Uh, so it was the perfect place to kind of launch the, the whole absolutely. Uh, PR for it. And I met him and I was like, oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> you are so gorgeous. I'm a la, 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 la. And when he kissed me, I was like, oh, that's what that smile could not be bigger. Yeah, as when a matter of fact, EJ, put the photo up one more time before I get to my next question. Yeah, you're right. Look at that smile. Yeah, you were just like, oh my God. Uh, one of oh, my, yeah. You know. So happy. So happy. <laughs> Oh, my God, I'm happy now just looking at it. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to bring up a nice memory. Random shots yes. from Karen Stewart. Okay, we talked about alternative music. This is an interesting – I always think this is an interesting debate. Best decade for alternative music. Was it the new wave 80s or was it the 90s when it went into grunge into many other – more 80s. 80s? Definitely it 80s. It was the 80s. It was the reintroduction of synth rock, which had mm -hmm. gone the way of the 70s at that point. You know, Yes right. and all that. Mm -hmm. um, the reintroduction of synth rock, uh, when I heard Kraftwerk, I was like, <laughs> oh my god um and you heard a, a lot of music from and i was mentioning europe you know all yeah. these different countries you were flooded with that and plus you know u2 was born in 1980 and that's there my you go. That's U2 is my i mean the only thing that could top paul stanley is bono bono of course I yes and that and, I and remember i've met that. i've met like the edge i've met uh adam clayton but bono oh He's like a saint, dude. He meets with the Pope like every six months. <laughs> I, I don't know. know. Yeah, well, of all of a sudden, we're going to call him Saint Bono on the farewell. He's going to be the patron saint of Ireland. Saint Patrick, you get ready because your <laughs> your days are numbered. Uh, saint Bono Day. Hmm. Absolutely. When he dies, dude, it's going to be like a Michael Jackson moment. 
Oh, no, I, w- I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. But hopefully I mean, he'll live forever, which is what I plan him to do. So we'll see amen. <laughs> amen to that. <laughs> okay. Now I can tap into something because I know you love Rucker Hauer. So I think there is an aficionado feeling about horror films. Oh, my but, God. Horror films are my life. I love okay, them. There you go. What's the better franchise, Halloween or Friday the 13th? You know, I'm so sick of the Halloween movies now. I see. I'm glad you're saying that because I feel like the last two or three kind of put the franchise from like here down to here. I'm so sick of that guy dying um, <laughs> that it's not even interesting to see the end of the movie anymore. To look forward to the end of the movie anymore. I'm just so sick of seeing him die and come back a million times. Jamie Lee Curtis, not for nothing. Mm-hmm. It's like milking this thing. Um, oh yeah, at least two films longer than it should. I, yeah. I can understand bringing it back once, but she's brought it back two other times since. So it's like. I know. And they don't even dr- address the fact that Mike, my, Michael Myers is like supernatural at this point. I mean, the guy just doesn't die. Right. You know, Jason, uh, we all know, is just a walking, killing zombie. Yeah. I'm going to go with the Friday the 13th because um, a lot of those movies have been fabulous. Even the one where Jason's in space, mm-hmm. which you would go, oh, my God, are you kidding me? It was actually a pretty good movie in its own right if you don't think about it as Jason from 1980. <laughs> You know, it's funny. You're saying that in my uh, engineer, CJ, I'm open the mic for a second because give your reactions. You were hearing that because I heard a moan out of you. What was going on there? Uh Oh, no, it's not working. OK, shout it out real quick if you can. Well, I like Friday the 13th. <laughs> okay. I thought it was there more than that. Me and CJ are tight already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You guys are good. Part seven's my favorite. <laughs> Part seven's not bad, dude. Yeah. Part seven's not bad. You know, um, I don't know. I just like the Friday the 13th idea of just, you know, this thing that goes around killing people over one little small, tiny thing. The guy drowned accidentally for crying out loud. That loud. <laughs> you know, and, I, and you know, I always trick people with the Friday the 13th trivia with the first movie. Like, you know, who, uh, you know, because Jason didn't kill anybody in Friday the 13th. Right. Jason wasn't the killer in that movie. It was his mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, people never really think of it that way. And, I, I, you know, and it was the introduction of the character. <laughs> But, um, you know, Jason was still a small kid and his mother did all the killing and people like, oh, shit, that's right. Yeah. Just like you forgot forgot where it turned. Yeah. But how Halloween, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. Glad we can get it. I wipe my hands of it. (laughs) Glad to get into that. All right. One more random shots. And I'm going to admit, Karen, I'm being a little cheesy here. So I apologize for this. The better traffic song, Crosstown Traffic by Jimi Hendrix or I Can't Drive 55 by Sammy Hagar. That's tough, dude. I'm going to go with Hendrix. Okay. I can't lean towards Sammy, but I understand why you I can't. I can't put Sammy Hagar above Jimi Hendrix. That would be like people would come for me. Uh, respect. Now, I can understand your logic behind that. I just happen to love I Can't Drive 55. I, 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 I love it, too. I think it's a great song. Um, I think it's perfect. And uh, it's a great driving song. That's for sure. That and, like, Golden Earring and stuff. Like Oh, Twilight Zone. Sure. I mean, come on. You know, you want to drive. That's what you put on no matter how old you are. 16, try those two songs in driving. <laughs> You'll get your first ticket, like, too sweet. Like, seriously. But um, I'm going to put Hendrix first. Just in, just because I don't want I don't want, I don't want the hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do want to send the hate mail you can that's right that's right you can find karen seward at 10 10 wins in new york oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. don't listen to him <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about no 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 i've only been babbling for god since 1988 so you know i've gotten away with it this long <laughs> that's right i'm i'm sure i'll get it i'm sure I'll, i mean you know i get picked on for the little you know i'm like i'm like the villain in the morning and I'm the good guy in the morning. All I right. get a lot of people. There's this one guy who gets so mad when I say we, because it's like, you know, I say, oh, okay, you know, we're going to be stuck there for like 20 minutes. And then I get a letter from this guy, an email from this guy, a letter, who gets letters, right. an email from a guy, from this guy, same guy. And he goes, can you please stop acting as if you're stuck? You're sitting there in your cozy studio. This is what he says. Cozy studio, probably in a big, soft leather chair, and I'm stuck in that, and I don't want to hear. I'm like, okay, dude. And, of course, I keep doing it. (laughs) You have no idea what this woman is doing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, again, like I, like we mentioned before, she's doing at least 10 reports in an hour right. and keeping on top of track. She has no time to sit down, let alone do anything. The yeah. only person who works harder than me in the morning, I keep saying, is my producer because, you know, I mean, it's New York City, dude. And 
this. Yeah, kudos, kudos to your producer because I know that's not a, it's not an easy job, and I'm sure your producer is really trying to stay on top of every little thing that's going on in the five boroughs. That cannot be easy. And he's got Jersey, he's got yeah. uh, North Jersey, and mm-hmm. he's got um, Long Island, right. and it's Westchester and Rockland County. Okay. I mean, the guys, the guys got him. And I mean, we there is a there are several producers, but he's like the main guy. He's like my guy. Um, and he's just, you know, I mean, that's a hard job, dude. Keeping up because oh, you cannot miss anything, right? If you miss the path train suspended, mm-hmm. that's your job right there. Oh yeah, I can understand that because that so many people are relying on that information because right. it, still people will you know, using whether you know whether it's New Jersey Transit, the path train, or whatever train you're using, what the LIRR or whatever, you know, mass that, transit's almost as big as as the roads, right? Uh, as far you know, and uh, but he's great, man. I don't know how he does. It. Like I said, he's got people who help him, and these people that he calls to get information from, like the Port Authority stuff like that, yeah. you know, they know him. He's been around for a long time, so that doesn't hurt. Oh, they, make, they make sure he gets it. Like they'll call and make sure he gets it. One so last question. Here. Yeah. I just got one last question. Um, as far as traffic is concerned, because we're all coming out of the pandemic at this point. Yeah. Is it, does it feel normal at this point? Or are we still, still kind of, cause you can tell by the traffic patterns from where it was pre pandemic to where it is now. Are we still a little off? Or are we starting to get to a point where, you know, cause you understand how crazy the traffic was in 2018 and 2019. And, right. Then we get hit with the world coming to a stop and we keep hearing that, hey, the city is not what it was, that people are working home more. So from your perspective, how do you see the traffic patterns these days in comparison? Massive difference. Okay. A massive difference. I mean, um, the biggest delay you'll see at the Hudson River crossings now is 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's rare. And that would be the Holland Tunnel always is like the first one to go. But you need now for you to get big numbers at the crossings. It's because of accidents. In 2019, you just had big numbers at the crossings because you just had big numbers at the crossings. Right. Um, everybody was driving in. Now, uh, you know, so many people work from home. Um, the traffic patterns are different. You were talking about patterns like yeah. uh, the way people are getting in and the times people are getting in. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's a big difference. But you also have to um, adjust what you're doing because of that. You know that roads that were the big problems in 2019 and, you know, January, 2020 mm-hmm. are, are not now. So it's good to kind of be when you're, you know, like I've been doing wins for a while. It's good to kind of like be that person, the same person from back then to now. Yeah. Um, because you just, you can follow it and understand it better, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big difference. I mean, it's a lot easier for people who have to drive in. Mm-hmm. It still sucks. Right. And there's still places where it never changed. Like in Brooklyn, it's always miserable. But, um, you know, it's definitely different. Karen, good to reconnect after a long, long time, my dear. It was so wonderful to be here with you. Like, so massively cool. Uh, please have me on again. We'll talk about other things. Oh, no, no, no. I, I think we'll have to do something where it's just, we'll just do a total music. Uh, exactly. Hang. Yeah. Enough about me. Get to the interesting stuff. <laughs> I promise we'll, we'll okay. definitely do that. Thank you, honey. Oh, thank you very, very much. That's a wrap. Have a great week ahead and uh, follow me on Facebook to find out the next episode and sign up for my YouTube channel. I'm not going to cost you anything. Until next time, for Karen Stewart, I'm Robin Kapoor. Take care.